So I want to begin by looking at one specific thing and show you how it gets passed down through the generations, through, the, through uh, history, and that model will get repeated over and over again. We were involved in international trade from pre-medieval times, from the ancient world, from antiquity, we were involved in international trade, and particularly back then, one of the things that makes uh, that a deciding factor on what is it that you are going to transport long distance, you need something that first of all, on the one hand, commands a high price to make it worth your while, but also something that is easily transportable because you're traveling hundreds or thousands of miles before there are jets and things of that nature. And so one of the earliest things that we were involved in already from our time living in Mesopotamia is the spice trade. Okay? Um, spices, historically, they don't grow, they're very sensitive, so they only grow in certain regions, and particularly in ancient times, they were very expensive. And so we know that already when we were living in Mesopotamia, we were involved in that spice trade. But moving forward, getting to the 9th century, has anyone here ever heard of the Radonites? Okay, so this is a really interesting historical story. We really only know about this group from one main source, an Arab postmaster named Ibn Qurdatbet, but he describes this group known as the Radonites. They were Jewish traders who in the 9th century, uh, or maybe into the 10th, I'm very bad with dates, um, basically had a monopoly on international trade. And they crisscrossed the entire known world here from Europe over here, all the way to China and the Far East, on four different routes that are highlighted there in red, crisscrossed everything. They traded in lots of goods, but one of them that we know were spices. So we've seen that in antiquity they were trading spices, and then they get to really expand, and uh, spices are one of those things they're trading. A little bit later, I will explain why it was that they were able to gain this monopoly. Um, we're not going to talk about it now because it will come up later. But understand that by then, that's what we were doing. Now, before I move on, I just want to show you, since we have a map here, I don't have the map again, but here is Egypt right over here. Okay? This is the Red Sea. This is Ara the Arabian Peninsula. And this is the Mediterranean and Europe. Okay? And there was no Suez Canal up here. Remember that. So moving ahead into the 11th, 12th centuries, 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, one of the best sources we have historically is the Cairo Geniza. This is not a photo of the Geniza, but these documents are from the Geniza. This is a photo of Solomon Schachter, who was one of the people who was instrumental in recovering the documents from the Cairo Geniza. For those who are not familiar with the Cairo Geniza, Traditionally, when Jews have uh, religious documents and they fall into disuse, maybe they've been damaged, maybe they're just not used anymore, there's kind of two things that we do with it. Nowadays, it's most common to bury them in a Jewish cemetery like you would. It's a, it's a way of disposing, them, disposing of them with respect rather than just throwing them in the garbage. More common in ancient times was to put them in a geniza, just a room that put all your stuff in there and leave it. And from the 12th, 11th, 13th centuries, there was a synagogue in Fustat, which is the old city of Cairo today. Cairo was a brand new city a few miles away. And in Fustat, there was a synagogue. And they had a room, if you want to call it that. It's more like a crawl space almost, that they threw all this stuff in. But interestingly, they didn't only throw in uh, religious documents. They also put in pretty much anything that had a Hebrew writing on it and even plenty of things that didn't. In the late 1800s, this was uncovered and purchased and taken, etc., and brought to Europe sections of the, the Geniza collection, which is massive, are in, I think, four or five different universities around the world. And so this is in Cambridge University. There was a professor from Jerusalem named Shlomo Do Goitin, and he was the first one who realized everybody that had uncovered these documents, what they were focusing on was all these religious texts. Some of them 
were texts that we knew existed that had been lost. And so that's an incredible source. Others might have alternate versions of texts, and that's a very interesting thing for scholars. But he said, there's a ton of stuff here that is not a religious text, but it's great for a historian. And he wrote a five-volume work called A Mediterranean Society, in which he focused on the non-holy texts from the Geniza to understand the people that were there. And one of the things that he uncovers is that the Jews in Egypt were heavily involved with, you guessed it, the spice trade. Okay? Remember I showed you how Egypt is this small land bridge between the Red Sea going southeast and the Mediterranean going west and north. So they would ship through the Red Sea from India and maybe even from China to Egypt. And from there, carry it across the land and go on to Europe. So they were this bridge. By this point, they no longer had a monopoly like the Radonites did, because in the 11th century, that's when the Crusaders arrived in Israel, in the Holy Land. And so that was their foothold into Asia. And so they were also involved in international trade. Things brought by land to Israel and then shipped by the Crusaders on to Europe. But the Jews of Egypt were heavily involved in this trade as well. And one final step to move forward is that after we go a few more hundred years, we get to what's known as the Age of Exploration, right? When you have like particularly Spain and Portugal traveling all around the world, going around the Horn of Africa and things like this. And they're involved in the spice trade as well, because again, very expensive, commands a high price. Well, Jews, mainly conversos, meaning those who had converted to Christianity, some of whom were what we call crypto-Jews, those who secretly continued practicing Judaism. Even if they weren't that, even if they were genuine converts, they still maintained ties with their family members, many of whom didn't convert and were expelled in 1492. And so there was a massive network of Spartac Jews. Spartac means that you are from Sparad, Spain. So these formerly Spanish and Portuguese Jews can maintain this network of trade, and so the Jews then were heavily involved in this trade as well. So we're seeing sort of a, uh, a passing down through the generations of the knowledge, okay? As a side note, because I think it's a great story, it's not about this, but it's worth telling briefly, it's mildly connected because of where the money went. So, some of you perhaps have heard of Doña Gracia de Nasi. Anybody ever hear of her? She was the wealthiest woman in Europe, a converso, and then later again an outward Jew when she reached places that she could live there. She was the wealthiest woman in Europe. Her money was made off of the spice trade. Now, I'm not particularly knowledgeable about Canadian history, you'll forgive me, but I do know American history. And in American history, uh, during the slavery era, there was something known as the Underground Railroad, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is, was a way of smuggling slaves from the South to the free North and getting them out, and then they were able to be free again. She designed her own Underground Railroad many centuries before that to get conversos, crypto-Jews, from the West, where they were not allowed to openly practice their Judaism, through Antwerp, which was a big hub of Spartac Jews, etc., down to the Ottoman Empire and to Italy, where they could again openly live as Jews. And so they were smuggling Jews along this route, uh, which is an incredible story, well worth reading, by the way, there's lots of books about her. Um, so it's a really awesome story. And basically what funded it, largely, was the spice trade. So that's a related story.